Thank you so much for granting us this interview, Mr. Selassie. So our discussion will be centered on uh, Sub-Saharan Africa to be specific. But first of all, let's talk about the importance of the spring meetings in realizing the development agenda uh, for Sub-Saharan Africa to be specific. So, you know, the spring meetings are, uh, as you can see, kind of an environment where we have all of the members of the IMF uh, coming, uh, ministers of finance, central bank governors, other policy makers, mm -hmm. coming and having a dialogue around what uh, what the, region, the challenges the region is facing, mm -hmm. and importantly, a peer learning opportunity from each other on mm -hmm. what works, what's mm -hmm. not working, mm -hmm. and we also get to be able to discuss uh, issues facing the particular countries yes. and how the IMF can be of help. Mm -hmm. Given that all our objectives uh, is really about making sure that countries are able to improve standards of living, right. improve development outcomes, mm -hmm. it's an exciting time, uh, intellectually stimulating time to be. Uh, Indeed it is. Uh, and now I had a conversation with uh, Madame Lagarde and I asked her this specific question and that is the 2018 regional outlook Sub-Saharan Africa indicates that growth is expected to strengthen for the region. But then we see that there are a lot of trade crises going on at the moment. How can this change the narrative? So uh, for Sub-Saharan Africa, as you, can, as you noted, mm -hmm. we're seeing growth accelerating from about 3% last right. year, 3.5% mm -hmm. on this year, and then for a bit further, so closer to 4% mm -hmm. in the outer years. Um, on the trade outlook, I mean, globally, what we've seen is the tensions, the trade tensions, yeah. uh, have had a bit of a dampening effect on mm -hmm. the global outlook, mm -hmm. somewhat offset by, uh, by uh, monetary policy action taken by mm -hmm. the central banks. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're calling it a delicate moment. And yeah. uh, our, our uh, urging caution in, uh, in terms of policy making going forward mm -hmm. to avoid a uh, downward draft on the growth. Yeah. Within the region, though, I, th I have to say that uh, we are seeing uh, some exciting developments. Right. And a good example, of course, is the African, uh, Africa, free, you know, the Africa continental free trade area, yeah. which uh, finally, with the Gambia's. Uh, yeah, the Gambia, uh, we have to. Has, you know, <laughs> yeah. means that there should be. Um, will be ratified. Yeah. You know, we think this is, uh, has the potential to offer a fantastic opportunity right. to facilitate uh, trade integration in the mm -hmm. region. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons I'm excited about it in mm -hmm. particular is that when you look at uh, the trade that African countries make with each other versus outside, yeah. you know, with each other we tend to trade more in manufactured, more processed goods, mm -hmm. but so when we trade outside that we tend to be exporting uh, raw materials. Yeah. So, uh, the free trade area has the potential to create uh, you know, a wide market mm -hmm. uh, in which more trade and manufactured type goods, more diversified type goods that we need to, to, to do more of yeah. take place. I would urge one word of caution, though, mm -hmm. like, like all trade agreements, of course, yeah. it has the potential to also cause dislocation. Yeah. So it will be really important to uh, make sure that you know, uh, any dislocation that's caused mm -hmm. can be mitigated. Right, Th and really good that you're talking about trade and, and that sort because, uh, like I said all the time, that Africa is beginning to be seen as an investment hub, and for that reason, we've seen a lot of global investors coming down to Africa. Apparently, it has the resources, resources, it has the people, viable market. But what does Africa stand to gain in the long run? What dividend can this all this investment yield for the sub region? Well, I mean, you know, this investment. Uh, First and foremost, I think you know what we need is foreign investment, of course, but yeah. also we need a lot of domestic exactly uh, investment. Business people investing mm -hmm. a lot more, mm -hmm. so, and of course, ultimately, frankly, uh, mm -hmm. it's domestic investment that's going to be the main driver of yeah. Uh, yeah. in our countries. Mm -hmm. uh, but what foreign investment often comes with is mm -hmm. not just uh, incremental capital, like right. additional capital, right. but also uh, ideas, mm -hmm. technology mm -hmm. uh, that's often embedded in. In, uh, investment from, uh, so it has a positive side effect, we can say. Side effect. Okay. And we have to make sure that our policies, um, you know, and these policy requirements are country specific yeah. in terms of facilitating mm -hmm. investment. But policies, you know, we have to make sure are consistent with uh, making sure that growth is labor intensive enough yeah. rather than capital intensive. Okay. So to absorb and, uh, the labor force to create the millions of jobs mm -hmm. that economies need. So, you know, that's the payoff. Yes. Yeah. We, we get jobs, we get uh, to 
be able to produce and consume more goods. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's a good thing. Right, and talking of jobs, I was really interested in this because we do know that it's one of the pro biggest problems confronting Africa, great creation of job, job employment opportunities, especially for its youth. But when we talk about uh, international institutions, financial institutions like the IMF and the World Bank, we see little impact of, of, of their intervention in this. Are there any new developments around this? What can you tell us? So, you know, uh our job is to help governments to fulfill uh, their economic development agendas. Okay. So, what we do, for example, in the case of IMF, we have three ways in which we help countries. All right. Uh, first and foremost, of course, is policy advice. You know? Okay. Uh, and we do that by sharing experiences of what has worked, what hasn't worked in other countries. Okay. Uh, you know, and then kind of making that advice country specific. So right. Advice is a big task. Okay. Another tool that we help countries with is through capacity development. Okay. This tends to be very technical. For example, a government ha wants to mobilize more tax revenues. Mm -hmm. What is the best way of structuring your tax administration? Office? Right. What is, uh, what is the optimal tax policy mix mm -hmm. you want to think about? Mm -hmm. you know, and then you can customize it to how you wish it. So you do a lot of and it's been working well for, for the countries. We offer this idea, the ideas, the opportunities for okay. countries. Mm -hmm. And you know, we do this through a number of domains, mm -hmm. taxes, of course public finance management, how yeah. to minimize social yeah. corruption, yeah. Uh, improve governance, mm -hmm. and, the effect, and the effectiveness of the use of public resources, mm -hmm. monetary policy, yeah. a range of advice. Mm -hmm. And then last but not least, we also, uh, if countries need it, provide financing. Uh, as financing is aimed at uh, closing balance of payments, right. imbalances you may have. Yeah. Um, the, the mix of all of these uh, support that we provide countries, mm -hmm. of course, will offer, you know, depending on what, what uh, situation the country is, yeah. you know, opportunities to help address yeah. development objectives, whether the focus is on jobs, whether the focus is on uh, repairing. Okay. But anyway, they can apply it to suit their own development agenda. Right, so wrapping it up, we cannot talk about Africa and not talk about debt issues. And uh, we've realized that in the spring meetings, the highlight has been on transparency, on debt, transparency between creditors and the debtors. For how long can transparency really, um, you know, improve our debt sustainability and also our economic stability? Just to be very clear, you know, what creates the debt is the borrowing, yeah. the fiscal policy stance. Mm -hmm. So um, by far the most important tool to control is you know, the fiscal policy right. budget position. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course, you know, not all borrowing is bad. Yeah? Um, yeah. So uh, indeed, for you know, countries, developing countries, mm -hmm. uh, even advanced countries, yes. you, know, you do need to borrow to be able to smooth the It's part of the process, right? Part yeah. of growth. So yeah. the, the point we're making mm -hmm. is that, you know, first of all, you know, the, moder the borrowing has to be in moderation, yeah. consistent with avoiding the sustainability problems. Okay. And then, of course, the terms of borrowing also matter. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, transparency around the making sure that right. the is being used for the right reasons mm -hmm. all matter. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, debt management practices are mm -hmm. very important. Mm -hmm. But as important also are is, you know, making sure that the borrowing is it's transparent. Reason. Yeah. Now, uh, thank you very much. Your last words. Where does the continent stand? Come two years. What are your projections? We expect growth to continue uh, improving. But yeah. I want to just stress that I, I remain very, very optimistic about the region's right. long-term growth prospects. Mm -hmm. As you noted uh, this earlier, kind of, this is a region of tremendous dynamism. Mm -hmm. and, Tremendous, so, know, much energy. so much energy. Yeah. yeah. So we, we think, uh, I think, you know, really, having seen where the region has come from over the last 10 to 25 years, mm -hmm. all the improvements that we made, mm -hmm. on this better, higher base, we yeah. think the scope for, uh, for the higher growth and take off is really significant, and uh, that's what keeps me excited. And yes, and me also okay. excited. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been a really fruitful conversation with you, Mr. Selassie. Thank you so much. Thank you.